Yeah, Rex, uh, I just start at people's origin stories, you know, also known as Alabama, which I'm gonna call you Alabama. But uh, I start from the beginning. Alabama, tell me about yourself. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in uh, Mobile, uh, I come Mobile General Hospital, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, born and raised to the age of uh, 13. Um, uh, losing my dad kind of lost a uh, uh, part of me, and I was became very unruly, and was sent to live with my second to the oldest sister in Charleston. So, going there, um, I'd peri periodically come back home to see my mom. I love my mom dearly, mama's boy. But the guys that she, the one guy she ended up with, I just it, me and him did not mesh at all. And um, we fought, and every time I'd go back, it seemed like I was, you know, being told to leave again by my mom. And uh, so I would leave and go see Teresa. And uh, it's your aunt. I, I learned I learned how to I, I learned to diversify a long time ago for a, for a southern guy, you know. And uh, but um, I. Uh, Unfortunately, to drinking and, 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 and using substances, I found myself in prison at the age of 37. I came out when I was uh, 42. Um, lost my, I'd take my mom off life support while I was, a year before I got out. Uh, hardest thing I've ever done, I think. Um, yeah, but, um, I want to comment on one thing, how people just generalize people that are out here. Um, it's, a, it's known statistically that I would say about 97, 96% of people have been uh, abused in some shape or form. Uh, mentally, physically, sexually, um, physically being uh, sexually raped or putting your hands on. I've had all three done to me. Um, that doesn't make a person any uh, their life uh, doesn't become meaningless because of some of the things they went through or, or choices they made. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> well I'm curious. We were talking a second earlier and you said uh, your dad passed away. Mm -hmm. How old yeah. were you? Eleven. Eleven, and you and you said you, you tell me I, about I, that. I I never knew that my dad was a World War II hero. Um, Earl B. Humphrey. Um, he was shot, and and they captured him, and he escaped. I found all this out later. Um, not at one time. My mom would unload things on me, you know, here and there. Um, when we were at the funeral, that's when I realized my dad was military. And they were shooting the 21 guns, and uh, he found out at his funeral. Well, I, I didn't like, know what was going on. Okay. You know, at the wake, I was trying to get in the casket with him to go with him, and uh, so uh, at you know, being years. a little boy at the time, so to speak. Um, but at that age, I'd done been through the uh, sexual abuse by a neighbor, um, physical by my uncle, and. Uh, the mental stuff by my uncle too, and uh, so it's kind of like a high spot, but um, it's still a low spot too, sort of, you know, because I didn't get to know my dad didn't. When you're a kid growing up, you know, you want to go and play and stuff. You don't get to really know someone as as you would if you know what I mean. When you, yeah, yeah, you start developing and your comprehension skills start. You know, where you're really understanding things, and you know, not a little kid beyond, I just want to do this, you know. And uh, I find myself these days missing my dad and hating him. Hating him for what? Um, uh, just leaving. Not getting to really talk. So, well, growing up, was he there? Up until, um, about nine years old he was, he started having strokes, and then he, uh, April 1st, 1980, we got up early and took him from the, uh, the, uh, um, old folks home, 
um, you know, where they can assist in their health, and we yeah. couldn't. And we took him to the uh, uh, the military hospital over in Biloxi, and when we got back from that drive, my sister let us know that he'd passed on us. April 1st, 1980. And you're 11 years old? Yeah. Wow, that's hard. But I got to know my dad, but in a different way. We were young, and we would go to what's called the fishing camp in Lucedale, Mississippi, up from Mobile, which is really about an hour, maybe 10 minute ride. And my job was to keep the snakes from getting in the boat. <laughs> and my dad was a pretty big guy, he's six foot five. And, uh, and when we couldn't drive to the camp itself, we would put a boat in the water and go from there like a John boat. Yeah. And I didn't like that. I wanted to, you know, like I say, I was a mom's boy, so I wanted to be where mom was. Oh, gotcha. Because as a little kid, mom would give in and take me and buy me something. So. But not your dad? Dad was stern. Gotcha. Last time he was trying to discipline me, I remember he had a two-by-four. He yelled at my mom and said, Gene, he's never going to learn. Uh, a two-by-four, yeah. my daughter's ten. Yeah. And I have an eight-year-old, and a two-by-four is abuse. My dad never disciplined me. He was always my mother. And I think that he seen what I was going to be putting her through and myself through. And I don't really look at it. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't look at it like that. I think he just huh. wanted to beat it in my head that I couldn't do certain things. I just couldn't keep doing whatever it was I was doing. Now he was a good man, I know he was a good man. He, it wasn't my mom's first husband, you know, and she was 35 and he was 58 when they were, you know, got it. That's when I came into the world, what, 1960, no, 1967. That's it. But my mom said there would never be another man like him, never. He didn't, the only thing he cared about was her and her other, my mom's, my sisters, Teresa and Janine, because that wasn't his kids. Right. Me and Sherry were an only kid. But he loved Janine out of this world. He sure did. And my oldest sister loved him, too. Yeah. That's the only person she ever called dad. Because yeah, her dad was a, I guess he had problems of his own, yeah. you know? Yeah, grief is so interesting. It's like, you know, how, how old are you now? 50, 57. 57, <laughs> and you still have that. I miss my dad. Yeah. You know, almost 50 years later. I still cry about my mom. Mm. Um, being out here, out, being in Seattle, period, being out on this end of Seattle is a lot different, I think, than downtown or, poor say, the, the White Center. I've lived in White Center. I was with the church out there for a while. But out here, there's something about Aurora that just sucks the life out of people. I think the average age expectancy out here is 56. That's when people usually start killing over. I've made it one year past that. I've lost so many friends, you know, sad. I'm just really disgruntled about a lot of things, you know, I see happening that I can't, I got no control over. It's all, all my friends are dead or on their way out. Why in the world I'm still here, I don't know. <laughs> well, let's really? talk a little bit about, you know, your current, your situation is currently you are unhoused. Right. And when did that first happen? How did that happen? Uh, I was here in Seattle 2008 and I talked to several agencies that uh, represent homeless people here and just by chance I got in at the Humphrey house and I found out later it was simply because my dad's last name was spelt just like this guy that donated the money to the Humphrey house. People say, well that is ironic, I mean your name is, yeah. Um, so I didn't have a, count, a caseworker or nothing. And my girlfriend's caseworker, um, oh, I can't remember her name right now, but it's, it's irrelevant, but 
she looked into it and said there was no help for her. Long story short, she got a hold of me one day. They were looking for me and told me they might have housing and took me to the Humphrey house. And I talked to Mark Lally that was a caseworker. He uh, got more, more of my information and um, went over everything with me. He said the thing they look out for is absolutely no housing is uh, sex, you know, sex offenders and arson. And I um, didn't have any of that on me. And so they looked for me almost three weeks when they had my keys. They finally found me. And they were like, here's the keys, you made it. And I made it a year to the day. And I was on a mutual termination lease. Um, some of the problems, uh, I say, if bringing people in from out of the rain and the cold is reason enough to, you know, put me on that, you know, mutual termination, that's fine. I'd go back and do it again. You know? So you're saying you brought people in to your place to get out of the cold to get out of the cold gotcha and i got in trouble time after time then my girlfriend came over and beat another girl up and you know and uh it's just sad to see so much money in this world and no offense to elon musk or people like that but i was personally raised that you, you help your people first and then you go on to extravagant things and and i don't mean any disrespect to anyone but it's just sad to see athletes getting paid so much money. Um, I play football, I understand, but why does a guy have to have $58 million a year? Where do you spend yeah. that money? Yeah, we know? were talking about that earlier. But yet you can't fix yeah. your inner city problem. Yeah, there's why? no lack of money. There's a no. ton of money out it's there. It's the people that just out of hate or, yeah. or, or sorry, out of um, ignorance, man, I add, that... Um, Every life is a, a value, I think, you know. It's, but uh, I guess some people don't see it that way. You know, they can have all the money in the world. And I know if I had $100 million, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what I could do with it, you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's an, it's, I look at it as it's upstream, policymakers. You know, you've got to go look upstream. We're downstream. Right, well, I'll go further than that then. <laughs> If you just take a general look at uh, where we are in the world, um, is there still hope? I hope. I mean, I really do hope for young people's, you know. Um, but long as you've got politicians in office that are going to take a bribe and do what they say and not what they agreed to the people that they would do, then you're going to have problems because people like Donald Trump, that man can be bought in a minute. He never, all of it, everything that my knowledge says that his dad built the, everything and left it to him. And he's, uh, since then, has, after his dad died, he's sold businesses and he's messed up businesses, you know. Maybe he's not a businessman. Maybe he's not a president, you know. Maybe he is the wrong guy to have. And maybe that lady's the right one have you know and that's who i'm you know for you know yeah, yeah. i mean you see it you see watergate you go back in time and you can see who was taking money who was taking bribes and not doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing you i know? mean that's all, all through the history of humankind right that's been happening corruption but unfortunately and um um look where it's got us yeah. scary now right and like a lot of questions they won't ask or tell us, why are the planes flying so much lower than they used to? You ever check that out? I don't know. You're you're dipping into conspiracy stuff there. Yeah. Alabama. Let's get back on track, sorry. <laughs> Let's get back to your stuff. <laughs> well, again, you're to the question of, you know, at some point you ha you were housed mm -hmm. and became unhoused. Yeah. And how, how did that happen? Because you told mutual me termination lease. Well, so you, if I would violate that lease again by any means, whether it be allowing someone to come in that right. was not authorized, you're out. But so you you were housed before then. Before, before I had that housing. Yes. No. No. I was here two years before that happened. And and uh, on, on the street. On the street. And before that was four and a half in yeah. the penitentiary. Okay. Now so before that I was housed. 
so after the penitentiary, mm -hmm. you got out. Mm -hmm. Was in Alabama for Mobile until I got here June the first, two thousand eight. And what happened? Why? Why? Why were you? Did you come out and bec live, start living um, on the streets? Well, losing my mom, the place that I was born and raised, and it it was just devastating to me, and there was no support at all for me there. My sister, my little sister, um, had two little girls, five and three, Kirsten and Kaylee. That's my little sister, Sherry, which I miss very much. I haven't been in contact with her in eight years. I don't know if she's even alive. But, um, you know, they, she was staying, her and the girls and her husband, Kevin, were living with his grandmother. You know, you just, yeah. you know, you can only take so much, you know. And so I did try to, uh, and I did, okay, and I, I guess I picked the wrong girl. <laughs> and two months, I was I was like back in jail. She said I was trying to choke her to death with a phone cord, and I wasn't. I hit the wall and busted my hand open on a stud. So the cops took me to jail, went to court. But my brother-in-law bailed me out, went to court, and the lady was looking for the girl. She didn't show up. She had warrants. She knew it was all bull crap. She released me in the condition I stay on my meds. That was that. But when I got out, this said person, I won't mention her name, Miss Everett, Deborah. She um, went and got me fired from my job. Mind you, I was uh, spreading covers, cleaning barges, and uh, I couldn't get a job then. And in Mobile, Alabama, if you don't have enough money to get a room, you go to jail for vagrancy. Oh, interesting. No questions, you go to jail. That's the law there. That's the law. If hmm. you're going to be homeless in Mobile, Alabama, guess what? You better go hide at night. Um, and that's just what I did. I see. And I worked. Then I met Deborah. And I got us a kitchenette room, motel, until things just got rocky. The lies caught up with her, you know. So I got, after getting out of jail and everything was, wasn't fine, I was still seeing her, but with somebody else. And I was getting madder. I did not associate with her or anything and then my friend let me know he goes man if you you're going through some shit here you need to go to seattle and i go wait a minute i've been to cali what am i gonna do in seattle and he said you won't be struggling like you are here and the one up is is he was right or i still wouldn't be here there's just things that uh you're very 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 limited to in the south and they pay you horribly and you work your ass off for it or they'll find somebody else that will. That's how I got here. Gotcha, understood. Do you ever have any kids on along the way? No. No marriage, no kid. No. Kind of sad world to bring a kid in. You gotta do a lot of work to keep a kid positive, I think. I think you would have to keep him away from the internet and the TV. <laughs> It can be, uh, well, it's everything, but it can be terrifying. I bet. I don't think I could handle I mean, I, I, I say I didn't have any kids. There's Rachel and little Gary. I helped raise them. They were my uh, nieces and my nephew. Right, 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 right. And I, another nephew, Mark. So, I mean, I've, yeah, I've experienced the yeah. diaper changing, and I've experienced the diaper changing to where you got to clean it all out and wash it, the cloth ones. Yeah, the cloth ones. <laughs> when was the last but, time you seen them? Many years, yeah. many years, probably uh, Morgan and Michael, 40 years. 40 no, years? Yeah, I'd say, no, 30, about 30 years. So they're years. they're grown. They're in Reno, yeah. Morgan wanted to be a game banger and he got shot at young age, paralyzed. And then Michael's kind of like the overseer since uh, Mike Jack Sr. died, their father, and their mother, Teresa. She's buried in San Fran. Your sister. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Alabama, I I noticed. Let me know if you're open to talking about this, but you're pretty upset this morning. Mm hmm. What was going on? Well, I had a, uh, these guys in uh, over on Greenwood uh, pull my bike inside their shop and wouldn't give it to me. Uh, so they didn't know what I was talking about, and. Um, I said, well, I'm sorry, I I, uh, I left it there, but you can see I'm back. I was coming back to get it. 
and he said still said he didn't know what, what I was talking about and uh, just having it rougher out here you know it's a, a bicycle isn't much to a lot of people but when you're knocking on 60 it can it can mean a lot you know what I mean it can it literally mean me getting hypothermia or me making it to somewhere I won't it really does it's not so much of the weather here but if you get wet and it is cold you can die of hypothermia I one of the saddest things I ever seen I gotta say this um, snowman uh, native guy what always he was in he was an elder and he liked to come out of uh, where they keep the natives he'd come out every day and he'd go have his one or two beers but he'd always have a blanket because as we get older we do get a little weaker and we have to maybe take a pit stop rest a little and he covered up with a blanket went to sleep he was fine until someone came by took the blanket and he died from hypothermia because they took his blanket and he was asleep because they thought they needed it worse and w when you say where they keep the natives you're talking about a tiny home specifically uh, no back then it was um or like a reservation or what um well downtown you got the old folks where they take you to the bus it's the old hangers it, okay and they got a place for the natives too the chief they, seattle chief of seattle okay. got it got it well, wait a minute or is that a different i spot? don't know if, no that's it but i don't yeah chief of seattle yeah yeah yeah, yeah. which i don't think is there anymore or they're gonna tell no, no it's still there chief it, seattle club yeah, yeah do they have housing there i do not know that and, uh, but natives are different here and they get money <laughs> <laughs> they well, get money that we don't, you know. I'm not sure. Well, they get they get native money, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as they should, because yeah, the white man took we're, everything. Where we're standing. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Right. Seattle, man, yeah. That's right. A lot of a lot of natives too. In years past, have been slaughtered right here in Greenwood. Yeah. Over in, um, you know where QFC is? Mm -hmm. In the back, if you go to the back and go left and come up that one long road, eighth. If off home right, right there where that bridge is and there it just you can be over there and you can if you stop by that little bridge and yeah you can yeah, feel it you can see into it you know you can see lights going and there's no lights down in there that's spirits they're oh, not happy interesting yeah what, what have you experienced out here you've been in on aurora for how long eight uh no i've been on on this end well, i've been here 18 years but i've only been like on this side about 10. Oh, only 10. Mm -hmm. That's a long time, man. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people go, a lot of people pass. Yep. What keeps you going? <laughs> uh, I don't know. The, you know, the hope is uh, things will get better for me soon. And, uh, my life will be a little bit more accommodating and uh constantly sitting on the concrete or or it's it's just you know i got a thing i tell all these youngsters put something under you when you're sitting on concrete it sucks you see what it does to a battery <laughs> what do you think it's doing to you and it's the truth it is the truth it doesn't matter if it's a couple of paper bags or some paper i mean i still do it sometimes usually when i'm pissed off and uh but uh that's a good advice to give, I think. Um, but yeah, just the hopes that things is gonna get better for everybody, but for me, I hope that's not selfish, but tired of sitting on concrete, uh, tired of having to get up when my bones are saying, you really should uh, rest, you know, and that kind of thing. Well, tell me about this place. Tell me about the commons. How long have you been coming here? You know, I haven't been coming to the commons long, but I'd say, off and on two years, yeah. but like it, you, you come over here, a lot of people come over here in spurts, um, or they'll be doing good, don't need it, and come and, but you know, I've come and gone enough to sometimes I, I like it's been a while, I'm like, I wonder if they're still, you know, and I always ask and, or come by, and it's like, that's good because uh, we don't, there's on this side of downtown, there's really nothing, there really isn't nothing, and these people are so wonderful that they accommodate you in so many ways and they work so hard just a little bit of time they're here and people a lot of people come here can't see it they ought to leave it open all day so you can just lounge no <laughs> but um they're wonderful people it's a wonderful place
yeah, yeah. I, I, I really hope it's uh, not X'd out by money. <laughs> that is the hope. It's more of that hope. But you see it so much, you know. Yeah. But I'd hate to see this place go. I really would. <laughs> How long have you been here? In Seattle? Yeah. Uh, since 2005. Oh. Did you like it when you first came here? I loved it. Really? Yeah. What about it? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I would say I'm incredibly privileged, you know, and when I came here, you know, I got a job and lived with people and lived in, well, I first moved to Edmonds and it's beautiful up here. No, it is beautiful. It's gorgeous. Right. And the trees and the air and the music and um, I've never lived on Aurora though. And that's a different perspective. Right on. That's a different it's reality. It's a different, it's a different tone. It's a, that I don't know what it's like. like. Well, I'll say this, when you're riding, if you're out here at night and you better know the game and how it's played right. and what to say and what not to say because you won't survive, man. You might want to bleep this, but you can have your ass handed to you, or you can have your ass taken away from you. One of the two. Yeah, and that's a, a different reality that. That's reality I happens every day. I don't know. You know that reality. Oh yeah. yeah. I've seen. I've seen things I wish I would never seen before, and nothing I could do. Wow. Not anything. Man. First got to see. I'll never forget it up there at the uh, Occidental or Accidental Park. Uh, old guy just simply exercising. And they just took everything he had and just beat him and beat him and beat him. But uh, I couldn't do anything. Same thing would happen to me. And it happens in every city, not just Seattle. We don't want to be all that on Seattle. And 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 it was some some dummies, some little dummies that had to do that to somebody. They'll get rewarded one day the right way, you know. Again, that's well. I mean, what comes around goes around. It's like, uh, yeah. It's, it's I believe a, in karma too. I mean, bad <laughs> things happen to good people. Good it things happen mean. to bad people. You know, it's yeah. just because I have to catch myself sometimes. What did I do? Yeah. What is going? You know. But and that's a very simple good and bad. And it's like, what does that mean? Right. If you do good, then good things yeah. will happen. Sorry, mom. Well, I don't think it got, worked out that way. <laughs> what is good? You know. What is? I bad? think good. I think good is something that uh, people with a normal brain function. Uh, if you're doing something and you're feeling guilty about it, it's probably not good. That's yeah, probably true. If you feel like exhausted but really gratified, you're doing something good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of people that donate their time, I, I used to do it. And I really sincerely enjoyed it, you know. Uh, seeing people happy and smiling, you know, just trying to help them out with little things, just yeah. passing them some food. And, Feels you good. Know. Yeah. It's like giving a gift. Feels great to give a gift. Well, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, the one lady, she was Oriental, and she, I couldn't get over her eating bread, you know, and I just met her. I was in the food line that day, and I was like, excuse me, what? She, I love bread. I said, what? I said, why do you like that bread? <laughs> she said, I couldn't get it where I live. Coming up, she never had bread. I thought that was, wow. Vietnam or somewhere, some small, some small village over there. Yeah, you don't know. See, and, and I guess that's true. I mean, because they, their thing, their main thing is rice, right? And when you go to most uh, Oriental restaurants, the workers, when you see them eating, they're eating straight rice. White well, there, rice. Well, there's a yeah, there's a lot of variety, but I think a main staple. It, I believe it, that's, that's what, in a lot of culture. Right, and I believe in <laughs> in that culture they do eat a lot of rice yeah, and white, do. and they don't put hardly anything. <laughs> and what I've learned is when you start putting all that other stuff in your Oriental food, that's what's the bad stuff. So they're disciplined. We all know that. Come on, <laughs> look at Bruce Lee. That's all you got to do. How 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 heavy was that guy? One thirty nine or something, yeah. and he was just handing people their ass all the time. Right. Alabama, one last question before yes, we wrap up. Is there anything that you would want the people of Seattle to know? 
um, take a good long look at yourself in the mirror about what bothers you about yourself, you know, before you look at somebody that's uh, frustrated on the street. Um, because a lot of people out here, they're just venting, they're upset because they can't fix the things that are broken. And be patient with them. They're harmless. They really are. They talk all... It's a big talk, a lot of it. I would say all of it. These people are just so... Been out here and they can't grasp it anymore. The longer they're out here, the more they're falling victim to what the the ones already have, you know. I noticed that, you know. Sometimes, you know, instead of calling the police, you might want to call an ambulance or something, or, or a social worker. I, I never understood that either. I mean, they should have, I, what's wrong with having some people out here that's walking around and kind of trying to prevent a problem that might take place later on, you know what I'm saying? Like, like caseworkers, you know? I, I used to see them out and about. Hmm. I, I don't see them anymore. They would reach out and try to help people. That's what reach is big. That was their thing. We reach out. Yeah. But you don't. Yeah, my guess is funding. Which is again back to the money. Which and, is again. And you go and it's up and up and up and up. Yeah, to where the the guy with all that money. Until one percent, right? Would rather destroy the world it's, than help it. It's complicated, man. It gets complicated. Yeah. Alabama, it's good to hear your voice, man. Thank you. Hey, thank you for sharing. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, you got a little mic.